Free Market Foundation, many familiar faces here. Um, we, this event, this moment, is the aftermath of our annual general meeting, which took place a few minutes ago. So we're delighted to have you all here. And just about a minute before the end of our annual general meeting, <coughs> our chairman, who had to leave us, asked me if I would introduce our guest speaker this evening. I think he does it on purpose, just to be unfair. Knows I like to be prepared. So, unaccustomed as I am to public mm. speaking <laughs> and to introducing our speaker, uh, you'll bear with me, no doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker this evening, Mr. Mervyn King and I have known each other a long time. Um, I think it was about 1982 that we met for the first time, and he was, we became the chairman of the company of which I became chief executive, the time, so we've known each other a long time. Um, Mervyn is uh, known for many things, but one of the things that I know that very few people know about him was that he went to university to study music, and he got uh, cum laude, uh, become cum laude in music, uh, initially, and only went on to law thereafter. So he, apart from everything else, Mervyn is, or at least was, an accomplished pianist. Ladies and gentlemen, I have lost track of Mervyn's achievements. He have so, has so many. So I have a cheat sheet here this evening to remind me of, of some of the things that Mervyn has done. But before I l uh, read what uh, I've been given, let me say that Mervyn also has been a great help recently to the Free Market Foundation and its sister, the Law Review Project, in preparing a very, very valuable document, and I think quite uh, unique in the world. My English teacher would have beaten me up for saying that. Quite unique, it is unique. Uh, and that is a guide to writing good law. Uh, something that our parliamentarians desperately need. And if you'd like to see it, it's the work of very many uh, great minds uh, in, the, in the legal profession, including our now deceased first chairman, Michael O'Dowd, who provided a, a very valuable material and a checklist for what should go into writing good constitutional law. Accompanying that, uh, Mervyn guided us through that as well as a book on alternative dispute resolution. That's ombudsman and tribunals and that sort of thing. Alternative, alternative dispute resolution ADR. We also have a book on how ombudsmen should behave themselves, especially those who work for the government and not independent. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Mervyn King is a senior counsel and he's a former judge of the Supreme Court of South Africa. In fact, he was at the time the youngest ever appointed judge in South Africa. He is Professor Extraordinaire at the University of South Africa on Corporate Citizenship, Honorary Professor at the University of Pretoria and Visiting Professor at the Universities of Rhodes and Cape Town. He has an honorary doctorate of laws from the universities of the Witwatersrand and of Leeds. He is chairman of the King Committee on Corporate Governance in South Africa, which produced King 1, 2, 3, and threatening us with 4 now, I understand. And he's first vice president of the Institute of Directors of Southern Africa. Mervyn is chairman of the International Integrated Reporting Council, chairman emeritus of the Global Reporting Initiative, and a member of the Private Sector Advisory Group to the World Bank on Corporate Governance. He chaired the United Nations Committee on Governance and Oversight and was President of the Advertising Standards Authority for 15 years here in South Africa, another body that I noticed the government now wants to get its hands on. Uh, he has been the Chairman, a Director, a Chief Executive of several companies listed on the London Luxembourg and Johannesburg Stock Exchanges. He has consulted, advised and written on legal, business, advertising, sustainability, corporate governance issues in over 60 countries and received many awards from international bodies around the world. He's author of three books on governance, sustainability and reporting and he sits as an arbitrator and mediator internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, Mervyn will speak to us this evening on the matter of major shifts in the corporate world and the sustainable development as seen by the United Nations. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce an old friend, a great man, a wonderful South African. Would you please welcome 
Professor Mervyn King. I see Brian still dares not speak bad of his chairman. <laughs> but um, uh, at the time I was the youngest judge appointed, but I no longer hold that distinction. <laughs> But I do hold the distinction, which I don't think will ever be beaten, is I'm the youngest High Court judge in the world to have resigned. I was 41 when I resigned. And I don't think anybody will ever beat that. So um, I'm delighted to be here this evening. I regard myself as a friend of FMF. And so delighted to speak. I usually, when I speak, never stand still. But tonight, this is being recorded and it's going out on YouTube. That's what this is for. This is so that you can hear me. <laughs> so it seems a bit to be a dichotomy in the electronics here. Um, <clears throat> as Brian has indicated, I want to talk to you tonight about major shifts in the corporate world. Because there are some major changes in the capital systems of the world, which is having a huge impact on uh, great multinational enterprises and will have a great impact on all of us in our lives. <coughs> so those involve some concepts. One is sustainable development, which means the, the maintaining of value creation, but in a sustainable manner in our resource deprived world and a world with uh, population increasing. We have, um, um, Brian told you, I chaired the United Nations and I'm still very involved with the United Nations. Um, so I was with UNCTAD just a couple of uh, weeks ago, in fact, United Nations. And the extrapolation is we have 7.3 billion people on planet Earth at the moment. And by 2045, we're going to have 9.3 billion. We're having a plateauing of population in America and in the EU, but on our continent and Asia and China, there's still growth. And meanwhile, you and I as individuals, and you and those of you who steer, because the word direct comes from the Latin word to steer, who steer entities, organizations around the world, both public and private, those organizations use natural assets faster than nature's regenerating them. Clearly not sustainable matter. Nor can we as individuals ignore that. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, I was speaking for four hours this morning. Um, so, it's a matter of certainly fascination to me that for the first time in the history of the United Nations that last year United Nations and 173 of its General Assembly, including our government, got together with some of the world's great multinational enterprises and developed the Sustainable Development Goals of the world. As to what it is that we you and I individually, and those of us who steer organizations, have to achieve in order that our children and our children's children will have a sustainable world at the end of the century. Because if we continue on the path that we're on at the moment, it will not happen. This involves inter alia good governance. The question arises, what is good governance? And <coughs> Intertwined with all of that is the rule of law, absolutely critical, because within the paradigm of the rule of law, that one practices how one governs and how one develops. So let me start by posing the question, what is the rule of law? And there are four major principles involved. Government, its officials, individuals, Artificial entities, companies, organizations are accountable under the law. Secondly, the laws should be clear 
concise and understandable, not ambiguous, not in language which is contrary to our constitution, nor that they, should they be laws which haven't gone through the rigours of debate of Parliament. And I'm afraid, as Brian hinted at in his introduction of me this evening, we have a mass of subordinate legislation in our country where many of the acts passed in our Parliament empowers ministers and um, their appointees, such as DGs, to draft regulations, which is really to implement the intention of the Act, but many of them have gone further. And hence, um, my chairing that body that wrote the, the book, which Brian has referred to, How to Draft Good Law. The third item of the rule of law is the processes by which the laws are enforced should be and should be seen to be fair and efficient. And the fourth element is that the justice must be delivered timelessly. You're all aware of that wonderful phrase, justice delayed is justice denied. So those are the four principles. And that was exhibited recently in South Africa with the Nkandla scandal. Not even our president is above the rule of law. None of us is. So what is good governance? It's not a mindless quantitative checklist. It's not that you take the company law as it now is, you take the King Report, which has become part of our common law because it's been recognized in some of the judgments of our courts, and you start ticking off your organization. I have a nominations committee. I have a preponderance of non-executive directors. I have an audit committee, which is now a statutory obligation. <coughs> Therefore, I'm practicing good governance. So the best example I can give you that this is not the test and this is not a definition of good governance is Enron. When Mr. Skilling and Mr. Lay, the chairman and the chief executive, had uh, shares as part of their compensation and they were entitled to exercise those options every quarter because as you know in America they have quarterly reporting which Hillary Clinton now in a campaign calls the tyranny of courtly reporting. <laughs> um, they wanted, of course, to keep the share price up as high as possible. And inside Enron were wholly owned businesses. They took these and placed them into special purpose entities, as they're known in America or in our language, wholly owned subsidiaries, and then sold the one to the other, always at a profit. And for the accountants in the room, you would now consolidate that up your bottom line group consolidation, smoke and mirror profits. Because it was always inside the company anyway. And of course, the price kept climbing. Then they ran into liquidity problems. Borrow money, even on US GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles in America, which is inconsistent with our standards of financial reporting. The borrowings would have been a liability on the balance sheet, would have, which would have impacted adversely on price. Um, what do we do, asked Mr. Skilling and Mr. Lay? Well, we will enter into structured financial transactions so that our auditors and our legal advisors can give us an opinion that these are transactions which we can keep off balance sheet so that none of the stakeholders of Enron, particularly the shareholders, even knew of a liability of four billion US dollars. And when Mr. Skilling and Mr. Lay exercised their options on every quarter, at every quarter, the major buyer of those shares was the Enron Pension Fund, of which they were the trustees. When the company went into liquidation, it impacted adversely on the lives of 77,000 people. So, and yet if we'd done a checklist on Enron, we would have found they had a corporate governance committee. 
They had an audit committee of which they had a foreign chartered accountant as the chair. They had a nominations committee. They had a preponderance of non-executive directors. Tick, tick, tick. And you and I would have said, Isn't, aren't we lucky to be a shareholder of this wonderful company? It's they're so well governed. Of course, it was completely dysfunctional because Mr. Skilling and Mr. Lay were motivated by the corporate sin of greed. And um, Mr. Skilling, when it came to sentence, because he was convicted of fraud, addressing the court, said to the judge that he was a very good man, Christian. I go to church every Sunday. Well, you know, when a company is formed, you have a person. And you get that certificate of registration. You have this artificial person. But it's a person. I wonder if Mr. Skilling had been the curator of a young 18-year-old boy who was injured in a motor car accident and became a vegetable from a mental point of view, but physically, the doctor said he's going to live well into his 90s. He'd been the curator of, let's say it was his 18-year-old brother. Would he have done that brother what he did to this company, this person? Now, the 18-year-old brother is actually less incapacitated than the company. The heart is still pumping. The soul, according to the great religions, is still in the young person's body. A poor, unfortunate company has no heart, nor mind, nor soul of its own until you are appointed its director. You become the heart, mind, and soul of a company as a director. That starts giving content to the duties of a director of good faith, care, skill, and diligence and starts driving one towards an understanding of what is really quality governance, which is integrity, that honest application of mind to an issue before the board, honest in the sense of unfettered, and coming to the board without the bias of present needs or past experiences, and making a decision in the best interests of that incapacitated person that's so dependent on you. Competency. But you actually can achieve it. You actually can do it. You can add value to that decision-making process. Responsibility that you act with responsibility and that the entity you're steering, directing, will be and will be seen to be a responsible corporate citizen. Accountability. We, and I include myself, for years, and so certainly until the end of the 20th century, filed annual reports which were made up essentially of the balance sheet, the profit and loss statement, and the related notes. And the chart of the accountants in the room. Over the years, I've given opinions and advice to the International Federation of Accountants, including SICA. I have an understanding of the standards of financial reporting. So I say with confidence to the chartered accountants in the room that you do not keep up to date the standards of financial reporting. They are complex, keep changing. International Accounting Standards Board keeps changing them as events occur. Global events, global financial crisis, for example. And the reporting in what I call IFRA speak, is incomprehensible to 999 people out of a thousand. Now, to be accountable, you have to be understandable. Very simple statement. Otherwise, you're not discharging your duty of accountability. If Brian and I, the company that I was chairman of, and he was the chief executive, if we had done our annual reports here in South Africa in Russian, well, certainly we weren't discharging our duty of accountability, but Brian and I, I can promise you, did our annual reports in an incomprehensible manner. Because we only did 
financial statements. The most comprehensible thing, I think, was the chairman's statement, one and a half pages. <laughs> that was it. Then, the other thing is fairness. You have many stakeholders in a company. And unless you understand the sources of value creation in this artificial person as a director, and you have an understanding of the legitimate and reasonable needs, interests, and expectations of the various stakeholders linked to the company through its business, and you're making a decision, which is your duty in law, to make a decision in the best interest of the company. But in the decision-making process, you need to take account of those sources of value creation, which are financial, human, uh, manufactured, intellectual, natural, and social. These are the sources of value creation. Not just financial capital in the sense of shareholders. Shareholders are one of the stakeholders. And unless you understand that, you cannot with fairness make that decision in the best interest of the company. Nor can you explain to the shareholders why that year you didn't increase the dividend because you had to pay more to your employees or the other way around the next year. Because you did that in the best interest of the company. And transparency, and by that I don't mean nakedness, I mean that you report warts and all, the good with the bad. You know, we have a natural human inclination to report the positives and to downplay the negatives. But as soon as you do that, the user is actually making decisions on misinformation not an informed decision. It's a misinformed decision. So, good governance, really, you're trying to achieve four outcomes. You're trying to achieve that your organization is an ethical one, and they seem to be ethical, and your leadership is effective. Secondly, you must ensure that you've got adequate and effective controls over your business. You can't have an uncontrolled strategy for business. Thirdly, that stakeholders generally and the society in which you operate, both the particular society of the company. I was the chairman of many companies here in South Africa, but just let's take one of them, Checkers. Um, you might remember my great advert with Clive Wheel, trolley for trolley, you won't pay more. <laughs> And um, but Checkers uh, Santon has its own society, it has its customers, its employees, its managers. But Checkers can't divorce itself from operating in the South African society, that general society. So if Checkers Santon, for example, never practiced transformation, it wouldn't be very successful. And you can see why it is said that society is the licensor of uh, companies. So you need to make sure that there's trust and confidence in the organization. And that's an outcome of the kind of governance one is practicing. And that you are seen to be conducting a business which is legitimate. So I'll just give you an example of a lack of trust and confidence in a company, loss of reputation, and a hint, or allegations of illegitimate conduct of a business, which resulted in one week in the loss of 30% of market value. The company's name is Oak Bay. Once the auditors, in terms of their code of conduct, which KPMG has their own code, but SICA has a code, and IFAC, the International Federation of Accountants, has a code, and their codes uh, drove them to resign. Then the banks. Uh, I was chairman of First National Corporate and Merchant Bank, so I'm very aware of the conduct for banks. And banks dare not be associated with something which could result in it being said that they were helping in 
laundering money, for example. So hence the banks withdrawing. And then you know the consequences. So all this, until the end of the 20th century, we continued to report in this incomprehensible IFRA speak. At the end of the 20th century, an analysis of companies listed on the great stock exchange of the world indicated that between 70 and 80% of the market cap of companies, that's the number of shares in issue times the price of the share, according to market forces, was made up of so-called intangible assets, which are not additives in a balance sheet according to financial reporting standards. What were these intangible assets? Suddenly, stakeholders, particularly the great asset owners of the world and asset managers are saying, well, unless we know the long-term strategy of the business of this company, I, as the trustee of your pension fund, can really not discharge my duty of care to you and make a decision to invest in the equity of this company on the basis that it's still going to be around in 25 or 30 years' time when you're going to retire, unless I know what is the long-term strategy of the business and I can draw a reasonable conclusion from that on an informed basis that this business will probably maintain value but in a sustainable manner in our resource-deprived world. What is its reputation? What is happening in the supply chain of a company? Asset owners and asset managers today are very careful. They do a due diligence not only of the company, but what's happening in the supply chain. And the great lesson that was learnt was Nike. You all remember when it was discovered that children in the supply chain were making their shoes. The next morning on the New York Stock Exchange, 60% of the market cap was gone. If that been a share in your portfolio and your pension fund, you would have had a big hole in your pension fund. Your trustee certainly wouldn't have been discharging his or her duty to you. Human rights has become a huge intangible asset and liability question. Any company seen to be contravening human rights will if impact on value. Stakeholder relationships. Absolutely extraordinary how civil society has become a major stakeholder of companies. So I'll give you just one example. Nestle, the biggest food producer in the world, and this is eight years ago. I want you to imagine I'm the chairman and you're all directors of Nestle. We come to enterprise risk management, dealing with risk and opportunity in the company in our head office in Geneva. And I look at the matrix risk matrix and the heat pad. And I say to the director who's in charge of risk management, well, it's very good. Some of the orange has gone to green, some of the red's gone to orange. Hey, this is good stuff. Now, can any one of you think of any unanticipated risk? No one in that boardroom said Greenpeace. When I say Greenpeace, I know what's in your mind. I think of a rubber dinghy stopping Japanese catching whales. <laughs> But Greenpeace is a civil society body like, driven by a South African Kumi Naidu. And Greenpeace actually fights for against the extinction both of fauna and flora. And the original habitat of the orangutan was the wetland forests around Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And if any of you have been to Kuala Lumpur, you will know you arrive at the airport and you drive for 50 kilometers, all you see is palm oil trees cut around wetland forests and planted palm oil trees, which is a great source of foreign revenue. Well, scientists and zoologists have been trying to keep the orangutan from becoming extinct in zoos, etc., but it's not working. So Greenpeace said, and this is seven, eight years ago, well, uh, Malaysia, why don't you cut down some of these palm oil trees and just plants some of the wetland forests back again. It's also very good for Kuala Lumpur to absorb some of the CO2 from it, add some O2 for it. And uh, Malaysian government did it. So they went to Nestle and said, well, you're the biggest buyer of this product. Why don't you do something? So the Malaysian government talked to them. Nestle did it. Well, uh, Greenpeace did a video on YouTube. I'm on YouTube at the moment. 
And on that YouTube is a lady going to the supermarket in Zurich, and she buys a Kit Kat. She peels open the Kit Kat, and out came the cut-off bleeding finger of an orangutan. Nestle ran to court in Switzerland, got an injunction, as it's called there, within 10 days. But by that time, there'd been a few hundred million emails, a few hundred million Skype calls, etc. Radical transparency. The cat, as they say, was out of the bag. Uh, Nestle and the Malaysian government did a deal. They cut down some of those trees. Wetland forests are growing in any day now. The orangutan is being reintroduced into its original habitat. Just, I'm giving you one story. I can keep you regaled the whole night on the impact on companies of civil society. So, sustainable development. If you go back to 1855, when the concept of limited liability started, at that time, the providers of equity capital were wealthy families, and members of that wealthy family became the directors. So other stakeholders, particularly the employees, saw them as the owners. If I said to Jane sitting here, I own you, you'd be horrified. <laughs> You're not allowed to own a person. It's illegal. Slavery was abolished 200 years ago. And yet people in public discourse say very glibly, the shareholders are the owners of the company. They're not. They have a conglomeration of very important incorporeal rights. They can determine the purpose of the company. They can vote in the directors. If they don't not please with what the directors are doing, they can remove them. And if the directors declare a dividend, and if there's sufficient cash flow, then they're entitled to payment of the dividend. That's it. In fact, in everything else, they're at the back of the queue. In regard to service providers, creditors, employees, everybody. They certainly are not the owners. And yet, we had our law based on the primacy of the shareholder. And we had the development of how companies were governed on the basis of a shareholder-centric model. And that moved eventually towards the end of the 20th century to what became known as the enlightened shareholder model. So the United Kingdom started, and if you look at section 172 of the United Kingdom's Companies Act, it says, and I'm giving it to you almost verbatim, the duties of a director are to ensure the success of the business of the company in the best interests of the shareholders, while having regard to the employees and the community in which the company operates. The community and the employees and everybody else put on the back burner. <laughs> and yet those who are at the back of the queue when it comes to ranking must be in their best interests, even in the enlightened shareholder approach. Analysis of the great companies of the London Stock Exchange has shown that as a percentage of the net asset value of those companies, only the highest of those companies of equity capital was 6.7% of the net assets. And yet the owners must be the shareholders, according to people in public discourse and many journalists. All these things became drivers with the mega trends in the world. And they, those are the following. The global financial crises, climate change crisis, ecological overshoot, using natural assets faster than nature is regenerating. Radical transparency. And radical, I mean radical. I happen to be one of the government's advisors to ICANN, which is um, an international body dealing with the domain names. Every 60 seconds of every 24 hours, so while you were asleep, another 541 domain names have been created. There's another 1.8 million Skype calls every 60 seconds. 640 million emails. If you think you can hide a secret in your corporate closet today, think again. The greatest expectations from stakeholders than ever before, there's an energetic activism which never existed before. Population growth, 
indicated to you, we are in the fourth industrial revolution. It's not a question of including digital, digitalization in your business strategy. The question you should be asking is what strategy do I develop in a digital world? That's where we are. We are in the fourth industrial revolution of robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, etc. And with the fact that we have finite natural assets which are being used faster than nature is regenerating with increased population, the consequential increased demand for product, it's quite clear to carry on business as usual is not an option. Hence the great companies of the world realized there had to be a shift. At the same time, the United Nations, towards the end of 2009, held a meeting at its headquarters in Geneva, where I was invited. IFAC, the International Federation of Accountants, are there, the big four auditing firms, the World Bank, the IA, and Chatham House rules, but we agreed that financial reporting, although critical, was not sufficient. Because it clearly didn't inform stakeholders about the true state of play in a company because if the intangible assets were 70 to 80 percent, which they were, and the additives are only 20 to 30 percent of the market cap, then you weren't telling the true state of play in the company. And sustainability reporting, which tried to inform stakeholders about what was happening with those intangible assets, clearly on its own, without the numbers, was insufficient. Report the two in silos was also insufficient because we don't run businesses on the basis of human capital in one building and financial capital in another town and intellectual capital in another building and with our relationships with our customers, suppliers and managers in different buildings or different rooms. These things are all interconnected and interrelated. Hence, drive towards integrated thinking and integrated reporting. So the first major shift in the world of all these drivers was to change the way we report corporately from silo reporting to integrated reporting. And we in South Africa were the first country to have our stock exchange to say it was a listing requirement arising out of recommendations of what is known as King 3. And in the last three years, I think we can be proud that the World Federation of Stock Exchange and the World Economic Forum has found the Johannesburg Stock Exchange to be the best regulator of stock exchanges in the world. Today. And although we have our foreign direct investment has dived, we still have enormous amount of foreign capital coming in, buying the equities of our major listed companies on our stock exchange. The second major shift in the world is a move away from the financial capital system, which we lived with certainly during the latter quarter of the 19th century and the whole of the 20th century, to an inclusive capital market system. The Coalition of Inclusive Capitalism was founded three years ago at Mansion House, Lord Mayor's residence in London. It was hosted by the Rothschilds, Madame Lagarde was there from IAF, Bill Clinton from the Clinton Foundation, the Lord Mayor and various other people. I was privileged to be invited as chairman of the International Integrated Reporting Council. And at that meeting, the coalition was formed on a basis that we can no longer have a situation that the developed world makes donations to the developing world when the politicians in the developing world are corrupt and they take the money and it doesn't, it's not used 100% of it for the purpose for which it was intended. And really what you needed was a corporate model that multinational enterprises, some operating in 140 plus countries, so let's take Ghana as an example. So Tata Motors operating in Ghana operates on a basis that they make sure how they make their money there has a positive impact on society and the environment, just improves the quality of lives of those people, enhances their economy, their society and their environment. That's inclusive capitalism. And that's the driver of today. The third major shift 
is we have been driving down the street of lost opportunity with all our entities, organizations, be they public or private. I call it the street of lost opportunity because we don't get it right now and change corporate behavior, both public and private. Well, we will not have a sustainable world at the end of the century. Simple as that. If any of you have read my book, Transient Caretakers, I call the Earth and Hotel, I call it Planet Inn, and I play the role of the innkeeper. I say that uh, we all want to board and lodge here. Tonight I have one billion of the 7.4 billion people who have been to bed hungry. I have over one billion of the people who never had access to potable water. I'm entitled to put up a big neon sign. No vacancies. And yet, over the next 30 odd years, we're going to have another 2 billion people. So if you think you can carry on as usual, welcome to the age of stupidity. <coughs> Can't. Simple as that. All this red led to the United Nations deciding with one some of the world's great multinational enterprises. So for the first time, an extraordinary thing happened. We had the United Nations and governments, which included our government, and great multinational enterprises meeting and agreeing 17 sustainable development goals. And these are they. We've got to strive to try and achieve no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work, industry innovation, reduced inequality, sustainable cities, responsible consumption, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, that's a rule of law, and collaboration around the world. And really you can cluster those under three headings, economic, social, and environmental. And that's what integrated thinking is about how does the company make that bottom line? We no longer think of value as the present value of discounted future cash flows. We no longer think of value comparing book value to market value. We think of value seeing how the company makes that bottom line and how in doing so has a positive or negative impacts on society and the environment. Is it in the years ahead going to enhance those positive impacts or, and is it going to eradicate or ameliorate the negative impacts? And here again, it's all within the paradigm of the rule of law. So we need sustainable development in the sense of maintaining value creation but in a sustainable manner. We can no longer make a profit without concern of the impacts of our business model on society and the environment, hence the three major shifts in the corporate world. And integrated reporting being a concept as time has come. The intention behind the SDGs of the United Nations and some of the world's great multinational companies is to have a sustainable planet for all who live on it. We have one planet, we don't have planet B. We've got to live here. The rule of law sets the boundaries in which we have to achieve those SDGs, which are so important for our children and our children's children, if they are to have a sustainable world by the end of the century. So as transient caretakers, we have one planet, but we have to turn it into one world, which is a sustainable one for those who come after us. Thank you very much for listening to me. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. King has agreed to answer some questions. I don't know exactly how many. It depends on how long they are. But uh, if you have a question or two for him now, he will join us, of course, for drinks afterwards. But uh, let us have it right now. If you have a question that you'd like the whole audience to have the answer to, sir. Um, I don't know if you know the, the details on PIC and its investment strategy. You raised that about the uh, pension funds and investing in things like the independent newspapers where 
it looks like many of the titles are actually going to go down and into quasi-government organisations such as ESCOM, which seems a bit shaky. How does that line up with accountability? Well, um, the United Nations have the principles of responsible investment, which asset owners and asset managers, trillions of dollars have signed up to comply with those principles of responsible investment. In 2011, um, one of the recommendations of the King 3 report was to create our local code of responsible investment for pension funds, such as PIC, which is a, really an asset manager, because the pension fund is the government employees, so PIC manages it. Um, and the code for responsible investment in South Africa, CRISA, was actually launched by the then Minister of Finance, who's now our Minister of Finance, Brian Gordon. And um, he said if institutions don't follow these guidelines, then he will be compelled to legislate. And the first principle, and I'll give it to you almost verbatim, a financial institution or its manager before making an investment decision, should take into account its investment analysis how the organization in which they're going to invest their ultimate beneficiaries' money, how is it dealt with environmental social issues, and what is the quality of its governance, and should ask the following questions. <coughs> what is the value of its tangible assets? What is the value of its intangible assets? Has it done a sustainability report? If not, why not? Has it done an, an integrated report? If not, why not? Has it got a supply chain code of conduct? If not, why not? And if it has one, how's it been monitored? What's happened in that supply chain before investing your money in it? <coughs> PIC is a signatory to that through a CISA. A CISA is the umbrella body in South Africa to which financial institution asset managers belong. So CRISA contractually is bound itself to follow those guidelines and certainly in its investment analysis before making investments, some of those you suggested, would prima facie not comply with CRISA. Mm -hmm. So they would be answerable to the ultimate beneficiaries and I'm, I'm still, maybe it's the lawyer in me, but I'm dying for the day that some ultimate beneficiary brings an action against some trustees of a great pension fund for failing in their duty of care to their ultimate beneficiaries for the reasons some of which you had elaborated. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, good evening. Maybe this is a naive question, but you mentioned that decent work as part of the uh, conditions for sustainable development. What is decent work? Well, decent work is defined as work where the health and safety of people are taken <coughs> into account. That the usual benefits of work are available to them, such as pensions, medical aid, that kind of thing. It, um, it is one of those very difficult issues, in my judgment, in a country that is developing, developing economy. Is it better to ensure someone has decent work, which is the mantra certainly of Kasatu, mm -hmm. or is it more important to make sure they've got a job? Well, um, I think it's important they have a job and it builds up to, but as soon as you say that, they say, well, you've, you've got this trickle down theory, you know, you think everything's going to trickle down and eventually they'll get there. That is like trickling down and being sucked up from having a job into decent work. But I, I just believe you've got to start somewhere. And you just can't start with decent work. That's why this, um, I am very fearful, I don't know Leon is, about uh, minimum wage. Because what is a justifiable minimum wage? Does anybody really know? I know there's a very, some learned people sitting and going to decide what is a minimum wage that we all have to pay. Um, many of you sitting in the room will know that when they brought in um, uh, 
minimum wage for domestic workers. Many domestic workers lost their jobs. So you must ask what's in the best interests of that country and the society in general. So. I would just like to know the masses, the number of people just don't understand this financial reporting and all the triple bottom line reporting. It's just not um, trickling through to the minds of the people who are who invest their, their money or who buy products from certain companies. How about um, uh, using uh, new technology or so, uh, maybe in the platform of social media, media or so, to, uh, or dashboards to show very clearly and easily who's the good performance, name and shame the bad performance uh, companies, and uh, then people can also have an alternative. But I said it, uh, so I can see that this company is bad, rather buy from that company or invest in that company. Okay, the triple bottom line is a phrase coined by John Alkington of the WWF. None of us has ever reported in the triple bottom line. We report in a single bottom line, which is a monetary one. And John has conceded, after much discussion, that really it's better to say, is the company, the company accept that the company is operating in the triple context of the economy, society and the environment. And the critical issue is, what is the impact of how it makes its money on those three critical aspects? And the whole purpose of an integrated report is to report on the impacts of how you are making your money and your output, your product itself, is having on society and the environment. So you have that in clear, concise and understandable language in your integrated report. So the very questions you're asking, you will actually see in an integrated report and many of which are now in South Africa and around the world. General Electric and America just did their first integrated report. Clear, concise language as to how they're making their money, the impact it's having on society and the environment. So I don't believe, although there's a mass of data being collected through electronics, analytics is going to be a huge aid. Now the Internet of Things is driving analytics as an aid to sift out what is significant matter for auditing purpose and for deciding what is material to put in an integrated report. But all the issues you've raised should really be in your integrated report in, quote, clear, concise and understandable language, as we say in the framework, not in flowery IFRS or GRI speak. Paul, Paul Mason in his book, <coughs> Post Capitalism, suggests that capitalism isn't the vehicle that's going to take the world into a sustainable future. Do you have any comment? Well, financial capitalism will not take the world into a sustainable future. That's exactly what Paul was talking about. But inclusive capitalism will. And so will sustainable capitalism. That's why I said to you, those are the major shifts. We're moving away from a financial capital system into an inclusive capital system, moving away from short-term profit-making to sustainable long-term thinking. Theresa May, in her maiden speech as Prime Minister, said we have to start making sure that our corporations think and, and actually explain to people what is their long-term strategy and not just look at short-term issues. So the shift, those are two major shifts in the world, inclusive capitalism and sustainable. So moving away from the financial capital system, which actually was a, that short-term profit was one of the drivers of the GFC. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we can take one more question. I'll see that gentleman over there's his hands. Tony, yeah. The University of Sustainable Development Goals. I might have missed it, but did you make mention of population issues? Um, beyond the way of yes. down under 7 million, going to 9 million. Because in this country, the unemployed youth are never going to be employed. Companies are getting smaller in terms of manpower uh, requirements, and there has to be solutions found. One, of course, is focusing on reduction, not of family sizes, because families are only one element. Um, there's lots of children that are born outside the, the family structure. If you could comment on that, because I, I see population issues is probably being the single most important determinant that we have to focus on. And secondly, in terms of the goals that were established at the UN, was Shell a signatory, or are they going to become a signatory to this? Because their record in the game... Who? Who's? Shell Oil. Shell Oil. Well, I can't remember. 
Because they, they I can't remember if Shah was one of the multinational entities, but uh, carry on. Their, their record in the Ugani River Delta is absolutely appalling, and um, they really seriously need to be called to account. Well, um, the answer is I don't know whether Shell was a signatory, but certainly if you look at Shell's advertisements, you'd think they, they're a bunch of zoologists or biologists. You see people <laughs> catching butterflies in forests and things, you know, Shell. They have become very aware of how civil society has turned against them because mm -hmm. of the disaster in the Niger Delta. They've been very aware, so they are trying to show a different face. But... Uh, the original question was on population growth. As you know, China started, tried to stem population growth with the one-child policy, which didn't work. And uh, very difficult to legislate about people not having children. And I'm afraid it's a matter of culture and education. And that's why you have a plateauing of population growth in the EU and mm -hmm. North America and Australia, Canada, but growth on our continent, growth in China, um, different levels of education, different developed economies. And um, the United Nations believe that 9 billion, the world is actually going to sort of settle down to 9 billion. So you'll see one of the sustainable development goals is innovation. And uh, I'll just give you one example of a pharmaceutical company, which I won't name, um, which makes a pill which I'm sure many of you in this room take. And um, they have, over the years, to take advantage of cheap labor in China, opened two factories in China. And their main factory is on the west coast of America where their intellectual property resides. They have developed, in the process of developing, and I've seen the prototype, it's no bigger than a Mini Cooper motor car, a digital manufacturing unit. They're really in the process of closing the one factory in China. Over the next three years, they will close the second one. Within five years, they will close the factory on the west coast of America. Now comes the frightening beast. They will reduce employment in that pharmaceutical company, which is well known, by 98 percent over the next five years. McKinsey, six weeks ago, Google it, did a study. At least five million people are employed at the moment over the next five years because of artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology, etc., will become unemployed, or maybe even unemployable because of a lack of IT skills, advanced IT skills. So an exacerbation of the unemployment problem. It's not a population problem. It's a skills problem. And it's a problem of the fourth industrial revolution we're in. And we have to think differently. That's why I said to you, you cannot think I'm going to develop a business strategy with digital mechanisms. You have to realize you have to develop a business strategy in a digital world. We're in a digital world. And so we have to think differently. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if there are more questions, I'm sure Mervyn will be happy to ask, answer them later. But Mervyn, as some of you know, may not appear it, but has seen his 80th summer and some. So I think we should be a little fair to him and leave him off the hook right now. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think that as free marketers mm -hmm. here at the Free Market Foundation, not everything that Merlin said would go undebated this evening. But the one thing that we are sure about with all of these uh, changes, both current and impending, that he warns us of, so long as the market remains free of bureaucratic intervention, we will all do much better than with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. King, and we hope we'll see you again here shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us now. Thank you very much.